Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, uh, Sucheta Kure. He is coming all the way from Japan. Uh, he's a GSPS fellow at uh, the National uh, Astronomical Observatory of Japan. He has worked on a variety of things, uh, like from Milky Way to reconstructions to magnetism to galaxies to uh, dark matter and cosmology. And he's going to tell us today about the uh, understanding of light from galaxies. So, thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, I'm Sucheta. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's get started. So, great start. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. Come on. Okay. Yeah, let me go back. Yeah. So yeah, I have a uh, introductory slide here. Um, so if you ask me what I do in a single sentence, well, I do a variety of things. But maybe understanding galaxy formation using machine learning, uh, combining both simulations and observations. Uh, and there are some other interests as well. Uh, and so this is the topic that I will be talking about, which is forward modeling uh, the galaxy of observables uh, in the context of structure form cosmological structure formation. Um, and so this is, I guess, the most important part of the talk, uh, which is that I'm in the job market and uh, I'm, yeah, I'm also open for collaboration. So anyway. So the general outline, so this is just a general outline. So I will talk about why we need to study galaxies um, and sort of the challenges that we have uh, in studying these galaxies um, and sort of our approach and why we do uh, the way we are trying to do. Um, and I'll, I'll, at the end, I'll give you uh, some of the ideas I have uh, in terms of how we should go as a, a field. So I think everybody is very familiar with this. Uh, you have less than 5% uh, baryons, but even among that, galaxies only have even less than 1% of uh, the baryon uh, energy content in the universe. So, so why, why even care? Um, well, because they are the, uh, well, the direct observables we see in the universe. And when you think about in a cosmological context, um, we say galaxies are bias traces of the underlying dark matter distribution. So the analogy is very similar to this, where um, the land mass is sort of traced by the light distribution. But can go back, yeah, so. So the, the key point is that it's biased in the sense that the galaxies do not trace the dark matter distribution um, so on a biased way. And so you need to understand this bias properly if you want to uh, extract cosmological information uh, properly from uh, these surveys because we want to have a constraint on uh, statistics about the underlying dark matter distribution which helps constrain the cosmological model. So we usually start, uh, as this is how cosmologists usually do, uh, is we start with a dark matter only distribution and then you try to compare with this wide field galaxy surveys. So you have millions of galaxies observed, uh, and now you want to match this with the dark matter distribution, while the simulated. And this is essentially the galaxy formation process. Uh, it starts from the dark matter uh, over densities to uh, these point sources. And of course, this is challenging. Um, if it is not, well, I, I wouldn't have a job. Um, so we, we, there's a lot of things we need to understand in this galaxy formation process. However, so the way we currently do things is um, we don't access the full high resolution image of the galaxy distribution. In other words, we have a theory that connects the large scales, uh, but not the small scales where galaxies are really changing things or having a bias uh, in our distribution. So we have many ways of doing this. So we obviously we have the linear theory of structure formation uh, and, and of course the halo models and the uh, HODs and stuff. And more recently you have this uh, perturbative theory approach uh, hybrid. 
However, I mean, we are still using a smooth version of the gal observed galaxy distributions. Um, so essentially, we are not optimally using uh, the information we get from these white field surveys. So understanding galaxy formation for cosmology is also very important if you want to maximally uh, extract the cosmological information. So, well, the difficulty is in understanding galaxies. So galaxies are very difficult to understand, as I just told you. And the reason, one reason, is that these are multi-scale objects. So galaxies depend on the large scale structure as well, the formation of large scale structure, the environment, and so on, as well as the small scale astrophysics uh, that goes on within a galaxy. So we, we have um, many orders of magnitude in scale we need to understand if you want to understand uh, how galaxies evolve. On the other hand, um, these are also multi time and time scale. So this is a very nice uh, figure that shows the various physical processes that goes on in a galaxy and how uh, and what time scales affect the star formation. <clears throat> so here you can have, you see these time scales uh, of star formation acting on the order of 10 mega years to all, 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 all the way up to 10 giga year time scales. And so these sort of all these sorts of uh, physical processes acting at different time scales are like galaxy formation. So it's a multi scale and a multi time scale problem. So it's difficult. Um, and that is not to say that we haven't made significant progress. Uh, so folks at CCA have this very nice uh, simulation suit called camels. Um, and what I'm going to show you is uh, four panels uh, of the same initial conditions, simulations, uh, but run with four different galaxy co formation codes. And I'm showing you the gas density and the gas temperature. Can you turn off the light above, maybe? You just push the button and it turns it off. Okay. We could, I guess, also turn these off. Uh, it's because this would be yeah. not productive. So anyway, the, I mean, all these simulations are calibrated to observations, but they look completely different. Right. Um, so in a way, what I want to get at with this animation is that, of course, we have all these different codes that this galaxy formation, but I, but we are not exploring the full possible uh, range of parameters that explain galaxy formation. And, and I, I don't think real galaxy formation physics is in is any of them. It's just an approximation. Um, right. So the way we do things is a bit different uh, to these high cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. So we, we have this connecting dark matter uh, halos to galaxies. And how we do it is to learn this uh, connection between galaxy uh, galaxies and dark matter halos, and and this learn in the sense uh, what I mean is to constrain using observations, have a very flexible model that is uh, consistent, physically consistent, but has enough flexibility to learn from the observations, observation inputs. So here, for example, what I mean by physically consistent is to obey conservation, for example. And uh, there are many ways to do this. Um, so this uh, fantastic preview by Jeremy and uh, Chris Alvester. Um, classifying how the way we connect dark matter halos to galaxies. So on this end, we have the physics models, physical models. So what I showed you are uh, the hydrodynamical simulations. So with these, essentially solve most of uh, the physics we know. Um, but there are subgrid uh, physics uh, that we use approximations for. Um, if you go a step onto the more empirical side, we we only simulate dark matter here uh, and use a set of differential equations to solve 
uh, the galaxy. So this is called semi-analytic models. And on this side, you have hell occupation uh, models, which statistically populates galaxies inside a halo. Um, and, and this is also constrained by observations. And, and so these are sort of the models in between where you have not as much flexibility than this, but more physical in the sense that you have um, some physical constraints uh, while learning from the observations. So the method that I am talking about today is called empirical forward models, uh, which sits right in the middle of physical models and empirical models. So I think if you're a cosmologist, you're very familiar with this type of thinking that we do not use only one probe to constrain our galaxy formation parameters, but instead we use different uh, constraints to get a tighter constraint on our, on our galaxy formation parameters. And for cosmology, this is very straightforward. I mean, you have some accepted standard model, so you have these parameters, but for galaxy formation, it's not very trivial. So we have to construct an empirical flexible enough model and constrain with observations. But why we use empirical forward models is, um, again, we can, because the model is flexible enough, we can try to match all sorts of observables uh, in a single framework. And this is not very easy when you take, for example, hydrodynamical simulations, uh, because it's very expensive to run, uh, and therefore you, you, you cannot, uh, and, and you don't have so much room to uh, tweak things to match all observables. And because of the, I mean, computationally cheap nature of our approach, we can explore vast parameter spaces, high dimensional parameter spaces, uh, and, and find the one that matches observables. And uh, we don't even have to have like a de deterministic match. We can do full posteriors uh, considering all sorts of uncertainties, observable uncertainties. And, and what's nice is this forward modeling approach where we start from the only dark matter distribution to the ones we observe, we can input the same selection functions and same uncertainties to get uh, the observer. So we, we have a proper understanding of uh, the uncertainties and the selections. And this comes for free. So because we forward model the observations, now we have mock observations uh, that are very similar to uh, the observations. And these are very uh, crucial for uh, when you want to understand the uncertainties, uh, uh, such as cosmic variables. So some key concepts on how we do these empirical models. Um, this is the simplest version of this em empirical model that I will explain. So we start with the halo mass function, uh, which describes the abundance of halo uh, at particular mass. Uh, and their redshift evolution. Good. But you have what you observe. So this comes from simulations, or you could also do uh, some theoretically. Um, but this comes from observations, where you have the stellar mass function, now measuring the stellar mass of galaxies. Um, but what's interesting is they do not have the same shape as the halo mass function. Uh, instead, uh, you have a plateau in the smaller mass ranges and a sort of a decline at higher mass ranges. And, and there are physical processes that change uh, this efficiency of forming galaxies from halo mass. So, so I, I just said it, but when you take this ratio of stellar mass to halo mass, we can sort of come up that uh, come at a galaxy formation efficiency. Um, for a given halo mass, 
what is the stellar mass that uh, we expect to have. And many physical processes or galaxy formation processes can affect how much, how much stellar mass is uh, inside these galaxies. So for example, uh, when you look at this high mass end, you have this AGNs uh, feedback working to suppress star formation and preventing uh, this efficiency to grow and to prevent uh, having higher stellar mass for uh, that particular halo mass. And on the smaller side, uh, you have supernovas, solar winds, and also reionization. This is the UV background that sort of affects star formation uh, in a way that prevents formation of stars and for galaxies to accumulate stellar uh, mass. <laughs> so this is sort of the basic relation uh, that defines the galaxy halo connection. And there are many observational constraints uh, for this as well. So if you want to do it, uh, I mean, the idea is you come up with a guess for this galaxy formation efficiency and try it. And because we know the halo mass functions uh, from simulations, we can calculate uh, a predict, we can predict a stellar mass function. Uh, this I wrote as stellar mass density, but you have these observational constraints. So now we can try to match these observational constraints and come at a galaxy formation efficiency. And we could do the uh, do this uh, as a Bayesian approach, and also incorporate the evolution uh, consistently. In our so you would have this galaxy formation efficiency or stellar mass halo mass relation that's redshift dependent uh, in a way that matches the stellar mass functions uh, at all these redshifts observed. Right, so that's the very simple model of empirical models. Um, we do things a little bit differently. Um, and this model is called the universe machine model, uh, developed by Peter Berguzzi. Um, and the idea here is, from an embodied dark matter simulation, we get uh, halo histories. So what I mean by halo histories is, uh, you have these halos. Um, these are overdense regions of the dark matter only simulation, and you trace uh, the mergers. So for, so this is with time. So you can get sort of a tree of mergers uh, from a dark matter only simulation. And this we call the dark matter merger tree. Now for this dark matter merger tree, what we could do is to paint or paste star formation rates uh, at each uh, halo, at each epoch. And when you sort of integrate over this dark matter merger tree, because uh, stellar mass is essentially an accumulation of star formation, uh, we can get at consistent stellar mass across history as well. And, and, and the, key, the key difference from the previous simple model is that we are now inputting star formation rates. This is the star formation per unit time instead of the accumulated stellar mass. And by this construction of integrating, we have a physically consistent uh, way of accumulating stars into galaxies. So we have consistent star formation rates and stellar masses. And how we do this uh, star formation rate is we write it as a function of the halo mass, the accretion rates, and time. So this is the simplest way to sort of write this parametrically. Um, and we can define this function uh, in some parameterization and constrain the parameters with observations. And what are the uh, constraints that we have been used are, so again, stellar mass functions, specific star formation rates, quench fractions, and so on. So we use all sorts of observational constraints to uh, constrain our minimal sort of galaxy formation model, that is star formation rates. How, how the halo accretion 
history affects galaxy assembly history. What's in the dot dot dot? One could imagine that a proper model would have many, many things in there. Right. So here what I mean by dot 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 is the environmental dependence. So we include correlation functions, uh, color-based correlation functions. What I mean by that is uh, red galaxies and bluer galaxies tend to cluster differently. And we include this information uh, when we constrain our star formation history model. And so this is, well, to first order of things, it comes from this uh, mass accretion histories, this information, but uh, they, we explicitly include this correlation, so that's the dot, dot, dot. You must need to include whether it's a satellite or a sentinel. Exactly right. Because right, there's no M and M dot won't yeah, get yeah. you. That's right. Exactly. But also, you must assume something about dust somewhere. If well, you get IR, well, you must have your predictions for the UV and IR must involve something with dust. Right. So. So there is a very preliminary uh, dust prescription in, in this universe mission models, uh, but. Yeah. I, I will talk about it, but we are doing a much more comprehensive modeling of dust. Okay. So, so what is the form of f here, the function? Um, let me see if I have. Oh, so, okay. Simply, you could think of two Gaussians uh, as a function of accretion rate. Uh, and the, why two Gaussians? Because we expect two populations, self-forming and such. Um, so, and, and we populate, according to this distribution, we populate the halos uh, with star formation rates. I mean, that is the first order, yeah. Right, thanks. And uh, this method works well, actually, uh, quite well, the fact that we sort of match all sorts of observations. So, for example, specific star formation rate uh, as a function of stellar mass. This is the cosmic star formation rate density. And uh, this is the stellar mass function that I showed you. So, it, it works well. So, so, what's missing, right? I mean, if, if this works well, so well. Um, there's uncertainties uh, and uncertainties in the galaxy halo connection. And this is uh, sort of the work that I am working on right now. So how we usually do things with galaxies is we have us here um, and we have this look back. So when we look further, we are going back in time with redshift and we observe these galaxies. But the point is we are observing a single snapshot of galaxy uh, and we cannot see the time evolution. So we have to essentially reconstruct the history of uh, each galaxy we observe. And we observe galaxies at different redshifts or different epochs, and now we have tried to uh, statistically connect all these galaxies we observe. And that's how we, 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 we did with Midwest Mission. But how we see these galaxies is we see an emission from each galaxy, what we call a spectral energy distribution. And a usual uh, SED looks like this. So this is as a function of uh, wavelength and, and the flux. And this has four key components. Um, so you have the stellar emission, so the emission from stars. And we can divide this emission from stars as these OB stars, which is like the young stars, or currently forming stars, uh, or, or, or for stars that have a very short lifespan. On the other hand, you have these old stars that live up to uh, a giga year, for example. And these have different spectra as well. Uh, so these are the two components. And then you have, uh, as we slightly touched upon, we have this dust, which uh, absorbs this stellar emission uh, from both young stars and the old stars and emit in this infrared, a rest frame infrared region. Um, so Essentially, dust covers whatever we observe uh, of stars. So we need to understand dust also if you want to infer the star formation rates and stars, stellar masses, and so on. 
And the other key thing is there is gas in, inside, uh, in between stars, so interstellar medium, uh, which also absorbs some of the energies and emits as uh, these lines. So, however, when we observe, we don't have this clear, uh, nice spectrum. Uh, we usually observe, I mean, for some galaxies we do, but for most galaxies we have these filters uh, that sample this SED uh, in certain places. And so these are, this is called photometry, and a ratio of this photometry at different bands, we call it color. So please keep it in mind because I, I, I'll use this color term uh, from now on. So how we infer from SADs usually uh, is we assume that galaxies is a complete, uh, a bunch of a, a whole population of stars born at different times. And how we do it is we convolve and assume star formation history or sort of rate of star formation at different epochs with how uh, the spectrum of stars formed at a single epoch. So this is what we call a single star population. That is a, the spectrum we expect for a group of stars born at a specific time. And, and this spectra also evolves with time because of stellar evolution. So we have this sort of evolution in the spectra. But now, instead of groups of stars or a population of stars born at a particular time, we have to integrate along the time for an assumed star formation history. And if we can uh, do that, we can get a composite star formation history, uh, a composite SED, uh, which includes star formation that has happened uh, along its lifetime. And then we have to have dust and gas that pro, uh, to pre-process to get a uh, SED. But as you can understand, we observe this and we have to infer this. So it's an inverse problem. And often uh, SEDs don't have enough information to get this uh, star formation history right. And, and the simple idea uh, is if you look at this spectrum, uh, these young stars dominate this region, uh, all very bright compared to these older stars. So in other words, what we could say is star formation at different epochs rep are represented differently in the SED. And more recent star formation is more represented in, in the SED. So if you want to construct uh, or reconstruct the star formation history, uh, this is very difficult because we can have some constraints on whatever happens uh, in, in the past, let's say, a few mega years, but very difficult to constrain a uh, few giga years uh, from us. So we have a snapshot and we have to reconstruct the history. This is the difficulty. And, and this difficulty amounts to a lot of uncertainties in the uh, ex um, extracted parameters of galaxy pro properties. So, as I mentioned, so because SEDs don't have enough information, there are often degeneracies in, in the parameters. For example, what I mean is, of course, there is a known degeneracy between redshift, star formation history, dust, and metallicities. And these parameters often change the SED in similar ways, so we cannot observationally distinguish um, uh, between these two. A very good example of this is shown in this plot. This is a, a recent observation of uh, JWST galaxy, where from observations, it could be a redshift 12, which is one of the earliest, youngest galaxies, or it could even be a redshift 3 galaxy, which is still far away, uh, which is still old, but observationally, it looks similar. So, if you want to infer galaxy properties from such limited information, we have to make many modeling assumptions. And this includes sort of the shape of the star formation history that I talked about, as well as dust, metallicity, um, and, and how and, and sort of the models uh, and the whole model of SED. 
And, and what I'm showing you here in this table is how each of these components that add to this SED can have uh, uncertainties associated uh, when est estimating stellar mass. So star formation histories can have 0.2 dex, dust 0.2, and so on. And in total, we have up to, for a single galaxy at redshift zero, 0.3 dex of uncertainty. So this is a big problem because, yes, please. Um, I just wanted to know a little bit more about the redshift difference that you pointed out, but possible the redundancy. Yeah. Um, I thought with JWST it's possible to break the redundancy with spectroscopy. Yes. Um, yes. So what, what is left once you are able to break that redundancy? Like what, what are the remaining problems? Right, so, so redshift, of course, we could break with spectroscopy, that, that's one. Um, but there's two key issues. So for most galaxies, we do not have spectroscopy. That, that's one. And the other one is even if you have spectroscopy or a perfect spectrum, uh, we still have dust uh, and metallicity. Or, so we, uh, let me rephrase it. We cannot tell apart a dust-free old galaxy versus a dusty young star formation. So this will still be the true even if you have the whole spectrum. The spectrum won't. We, 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 well, to a certain extent, we can tell apart if we have if we input priors into it, and this is the key point. And, and uh, right, so so one thing is more for most of them we don't have spectra, and, and even if you have spectra, we still have this the CD degeneracy. Of course, we can try to de uh, break this degeneracy if you add dust emission, for example, in, in infrared. Uh, but uh, this is, I, I'm still not working on this right now. But what I want to highlight here is that due to these many uh, modeling assumptions we make, uh, we, we can have uncertainties in basic properties of the galaxies we observe. And so with my approach, so we did sidetrack a bit, but we are trying to sort of answer or minimize this error um, in modeling, uh, with, with modeling, so, so we can reduce these uncertainties uh, in, in, with these three models. So sorry, um, I thought actually like, if you look at the observation of the, like um, the star formation, they have uh, maybe scattered about 0.3 deck, and this is something also in the simulation we see like 0.3 deck, right? So, are you saying that like 0.3 is a lot, or I mean, because I think most of the observation they have about 0.3, right? Are, are you talking about uh, uncertainties or like the intrinsic uh, sort of? Yeah, like sense. just the fluctuation around the mean. So yes. So if you if you if you take star formation rates, we, we do have that and we do model that. But here what I'm saying is uh, in your estimates you have uncertainty for up to 0.3x. Okay. Yeah. There is intrinsic sort of variation. Um, but 0.3x for stellar mass, that's that's a big uncertainty, right? Star formation rates, you, you could have sort of uh, uncertainty. Uh, if you look at the relationship between stellar mass and SFR, for example, you expect certain scatter uh, in this uh, relationship, but in, this is uncertainty in uh, measurements. So the new approach is what I talked about before, but instead of just SFR, we model dust and metallicity that's necessary to model SEDs. And, and we do that also similarly as a function of uh, the mass accretion histories. And we now constrain this with observations, but now we don't have to rely on stellar mass functions or star formation rate densities. We can directly match 
the observed color distributions or color uh, this SED distributions we observe. Uh, so, so removing sort of uncertainties that may have in uh, getting these estimates. And we can directly constrain. Um, so in practice though, I, I, how I model this is we have for each halo we have stellar mass and star formation rate. So this metallicity and dust, uh, I, I model it in such a way. But star formation rate should always be a uh, should already be a function of these masses and history so we, we are still good and what we essentially have is a SED as a function of mass and history so what is the benefit of doing this um, of matching the distribution of SEDs we observe so usually what we do when we match SEDs is we take a single SED and try to calculate the maximum likelihood estimate uh, with galaxy properties and a star formation history and so on. But now we, instead of a single SED, we could pick the whole population that we see because we can apply consistent selection functions, whether uh, uh, some survey picks up a galaxy or not as well and sort of fit the whole distribution SED uh, and constrain this model. And, and, and the maximum likelihood solution for the whole population should also be different from individual's maximum likelihood and summing them up. And in reverse, so, so, so in other words, we have a population level SED fitting goal uh, that is consistent with the whole population evolution. And, and, and then, because we have this evol consistent evolution, um, so when I talked about this age and dust uh, degeneracy, we have consistent evolution of the ages of star formation histories. So it helps break this degeneracy in SEDs uh, between dust and uh, star formation history. And also, what, what's nice is because we are fitting. If you're saying like, a you know, if I have something at low redshift, is it dusty? Is it red? It has evolved in a different way, and so my interpretation of it as dusty or red has, or dusty or old, has different implications for what the progenitor population looks like. And this method uses that information. That's what you mean. So, yes, so yes, yes, that's right, yes, pro, pro, so because we can calculate the progenitor population and we have the color distribution at that redshift, we can sort of constrain the allowed range of star formation histories at that higher redshift. And, and that sort of self-consistently gives priors on constraining star formation histories. Is there a danger of like somehow influencing what we might end up calling like a physical star formation model because you're learning from observations which might be missing the physical stuff anyway? Where is that? So, so you're saying we might miss some observations, so we might have a bit different. No, I'm, I'm wondering if because you're constraining using observations, right? I understand that you might take into account selection functions, but those are probably also based on some assumptions about what is physically going on. Could you use that to constrain physical models? Mm -hmm. Is there a danger of like missing? physical processes altogether because they weren't there in any of the steps. Right, so well, I mean your concern is right. Um, so selection functions, how we do it is simply uh, whether something is bright enough to be picked up. Mm -hmm. That is that is the only selection function we do. Uh, but there's 
definitely a lot of physics that we don't we don't model because we are just modeling star formation rate as a function of uh, halo history but is i mean for one thing we assume that dark matter uh, halo assembly is not affected by baryons for example in return this is an assumption that we do and, but, and that's not true so these physics we don't take into account for example or we don't explicitly model the gas evolution in this case so these are physical processes that we are not modeling but they say but what we could do with this model is sort of have a in a way self-consistent measurement of the star formation histories uh, or metallicity histories or dust parameter histories and, and that can be useful for someone who is doing more physical hydrodynamical simulations for example to, to compare as well if that answers the question in one of your main physical things you that this doesn't there are definitely unphysical things yeah you, that this can do but one way in which it remains physical is i assume all the star formation as things go along has to be positive yeah right sure sure yeah <laughs> like whereas when you do individual scd fitting at high redshift and low redshift at high redshift i could get a very massive star formation you know stellar mass function and a low redshift are very low yeah. like i could get that yeah. if i if i did things a certain way i could arrange to have the star you know the star formation the the stellar mass density go down with time mm. which would be impossible but in your fitting you don't allow that yeah, yeah. So, so there's certain ways in which you're protected from doing things on physical, but in other ways you're not, for sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, also it depends on the physical form of F, right? What function that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That can do something that doesn't obey the laws. Of yeah, physics, because that that sure. is you have infinite <laughs> infinite solutions. Right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah, sure, sure. is it going to be linear, non-linear? I like this is what I wanted to ask. I mean, if you model them at like different Gaussian distributions, right? They might fit the observation, but they might not. Uh, give you the same trends you, the, you see in the simulation, like star formation is uh, increases with higher mass or uh, non linearly or high, like in high masses or stuff like that, right? So you might miss some of the trends, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, right. But I think it, this is very useful, like if you want to fit for high dimensional uh, parameters, which is much easier to do than the actual uh, simulations, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and something I should add. Um, so, yeah, it is. We are also not, in a way, philosophically interested in modeling everything in this format because there's limited information from observations. So, we are trying to get a minimal model that matches the observations, right? So, so, so it's, it's philosophically a bit different from hydrodynamical simulations or, or simulation that models everything. And as you say also, but they might all be wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to say that, but... <laughs> no, I mean, of course. I mean, this is all the whole... Yeah. Right. Yeah, thanks. Right. Uh, and, and yes, so, so matching colors is difficult, is what I want to say. Uh, so even the state of the art, hydrodynamical simulations, we, we, we still don't have a way to completely match. Uh, these color distributions. Um, with our approach, I'm getting there. So this is a very preliminary result. Um, I, yeah. So don't don't just just to say that I'm getting there. <laughs> so these are different colors. Uh, so this is u minus g. So these are different wavelength uh, ratios, uh, and this is uh, stellar mass pins. Um, and the solid is the observations. And the solid line, uh, well, the line is the predicted model. So uh, there are some, a lot of uh, discrepancies, but yeah. What solar populations are you using? Uh, the model for? Yeah, what, what's, just what's the S? SPS? Yeah. We are using FSPS. Yeah. So yeah, the, I'm going to see it's hard to fix without, without right. messing with the solar population. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so so I, I minus g, I don't know, and u minus g uh, also I guess 
it's a little bit difficult to match. But yeah, although I mean, you look at that and it's like, well, you have too many red and you know, you have too many red galaxies of O mass. Yeah. Right. Like, and it like there's a you can do something to the star formation rates to change that. That's right. That's right. But the I minus Z offset, it's like it's hard to tweak that. It's just what the stars. Look like. <laughs> So what parameters do you usually tweak in these stellar model, population models? Like the age or the metallicity or? Well, uh, yes, those things, but you have control over those things in your model. Yeah. Um, but then there's, you know, the, like, the set of stars that's used to change a star formation history into a color and the spectra of the stars that, that, that you're using. And dust, how do you want it? Yeah, dust as well, yeah. So, I have a question about this. Yes. So you have too many low mass red galaxies. This is like the opposite problem that everybody else has when trying to model this thing, where they have <laughs> not enough. I mean, maybe this is too much in the weeds and we can talk about it afterwards, but, yeah. but, but is this just from, now that you're doing this new stuff of, of the SED modeling and the incorporation of the dust modeling, or is there something else going? I wouldn't believe too much of this. Okay. So yeah, um, no, I, I mean I don't believe. Yeah, we keep much. forgetting these two words in the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have made it bigger. Yeah. <laughs> so when you say when you you, you say that there is too many uh, in the small galaxy, which one are you looking at? Because I'm, I'm confused now. The blue column. The, the blue column. Okay. Too, too many. Oh, I see. So then the the, the the shaded area is the observation, right? Yes. And okay. And because the distribution is just shifted towards left. I think Jeremy is worried about that right shoulder. I think this one is weird. Uh, um, I mean, this one is fine. So you're not fitting the observations of the star formation rates, or you are, you're incorporating both color information, SED information, and the star formation We are not of. using star formation rates anymore. Okay. So I, I, I do wonder, and maybe once again, you're going to get into this, but I do wonder about like this is a bit of zero sum, right? People that, that try and calculate the star formation rates are using all the SD information, using FSPS and all that stuff to go from the observations to get the star formation rates, and you're using the exact same tools to go backward. What's the benefit of doing it your way? What's the extra information? The, the star formation histories uh, and the added, added information is modeling as a population. Right, yeah, okay, yes, that makes sense. Uh, and, and that, so, so <coughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Well, G minus R at least we did get it right. Uh, that, that's good news. So this is only matching on G minus R. I guess that's not a too difficult of a task. This is just my redshift, just G minus R. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Um, but some things that I had to think about is, of course, the selection function. But we specifically had to add metallicity scatter uh, to get red galaxies right. Um, and also attend, uh, scatter in dust attenuation parameters and so on, and also for the materials. So. And, and well, we, we could do it for arbitrary bands. Anyway, um, so now we have a way to sort of statistically constrain from SEDs. Um, but I ask, oh, well, yeah. Also, yeah. So, so now we have a way to sort of statistically constrain or connect all these observations. And what we would have is a picture of stellar masses, star formation rates, metallicity, and dust, and how they evolve uh, up to around maybe redshift oh, 13, 14. Um, and, and this is including JWST data. And, and because of this additional information that comes with the population level modeling, uh, we have better estimates of star formation rates and stellar masses, and therefore reduce uncertainties on galaxy halo connection. Uh, and, and I guess for cosmologists, this is good news. We have more catalogs as well. Uh, for upcoming surveys, we could just generate more catalogs the same way we do the fitting, because essentially we are forward module. 
and um, because we run only on dark matter only simulations, um, we, we could go for larger cosmological volumes than that would be possible with hydrodynamical simulations. So, yes, going back to this. So now we have a way to connect this, but we don't observe colors only. We observe real galaxy majors, so morphology of galaxies, right? And so now what I want to do is, can we get direct information from morphologies or observed images of galaxies? And essentially what we have to do is close this light uh, that includes morphology. And we could do that with generative models. So if these are machine learning models. We are familiar with ChatGPT. Um, but essentially what it does is it learns the distribution of uh, whatever you put in. And here what we can do is we put in images from these telescopes and learn the distribution of morphologies. These look very realistic, but these are fake uh, SDSS images. Uh, I, I think they look uh, really fantastic. Um, but what we could do is we, we, we have all sorts of more machine learning models for this. But you can take this generator part, which is some take some random value and spits out a realistic looking galaxy, but we could condition um, this generation uh, with the information that's coming from the empirical forward model. So that is the SEDs. And so like ChatGPT giving us relevant information using a prompt, we can condition from uh, our, the information that comes from the forward model. So to get meaningful galaxy morphologies. And one example is this. So this is stellar mass and star formation rates and each uh, patch represents a generated uh, galaxy from this model. So you could see how in heavier galaxies, you have these redder colors and also these morphologies tend to be like disky compared to uh, these uh, heavier elliptical galaxies. So now we could do this uh, essentially with a machine learning model. Uh, so this what I'm showing you is if you condition on spectra, what is the generated image? So for different spectra, we could get different galaxy majors. Yeah, and this well, <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, what's convincing. <laughs> <laughs> and what's nice is starting from uh, dark matter only distribution, we could generate this. This is a fake mock image that we made. So we have, I mean, it goes through many steps. So you get, we find halos from the dark matter distribution, populate star formation or galaxy properties, which include star formation rates, stellar masses, metallicity, and dust. And from there, you have uh, this generator model that create, translates it to morphologies. And now you just paste it uh, and scale it accordingly, which is uh, something we could constrain as well. Um, and then we get these images. These are very realistic looking images. And now we could essentially do image to image comparison to infer galaxy formation. Of course, the particular geometry makes one think you may have a gravitational lens there, but your model doesn't. Uh, yeah, yeah. Gravitational lensing. So, so there's certain it's, things you yeah, won't yeah. capture. Sure. Um, so, lensing and intrinsic alignment. So, how galaxies would align with uh, halos this is a big question mark um, but yeah i mean something this is maybe five ten years down the line but should be possible too, if you do all these models right so so now we have a way uh, to forward model of the images and because we do it in a post like situation way essentially we can make many general realizations as well and it will be pretty quick uh, than running hydrodynamical solutions. So this is uh, the pixel level inference that I talked about. Um, and by doing this way, we could constrain our galaxy sizes and shape evolution. Uh, that's something we could not do with the previous model. And well, highly realistic mock images that could be very useful when you're doing end-to-end -end pipeline testing. Uh, for surveys, as well as building new science cases, uh, 
because we essentially have a very realistic image or a catalog uh, that's observationally con consistent with all the past observations. Right, so last few minutes, I think I'll, I'll talk a bit about how I see this going forward. So for galaxy formation, uh, now we have a way to very optimally extract physical information from observations. Uh, and and, and as, as you mentioned, we could now add model complexity uh, to this framework. And so there have been work uh, that does this, so adding black hole evolution, gas evolution, metallicity evolution. So this is already uh, works that have been done uh, within this framework. And also this is the morphology part of it. Um, so mass profile, so adding light profiles to the dark matter profiles. And we touched upon slightly, but uh, what are sort of the fundamental parameters? What's the correct parameterization that needs to get this uh, model? <clears throat> That's something that I've looked at in the past as well. Uh, so do I talk about? And also what we find with these models is all correlations. Now, can we get at causations, causality? Uh, this is something I'm interested in. There are many uh, machine learning tools that can help uh, sort of break correlations into cause causalities as well. And then we, we, we could also think about, this is something we don't, uh, or we, we take it for granted, this galaxy form, we ask galaxy formation people is that we fix cosmology. Um, but that might not be true, I mean, shouldn't be. So can we do sort of a joint analysis of marginalizing all cosmology? Absolutely. And for cosmology, well, the most straightforward is the mock catalogs, um, as I mentioned, the tests. Uh, and something that I'm very, very excited about is because we can now uh, forward model galaxies and efficiently, we can write a loss function for what our new science code should be. And, and, and essentially, it will give us a new design of a survey that we might not even think about in a data-driven way. Uh, so for next generation surveys, this might be very useful. And, and this would sort of maximize scientific outcome. And so this is the field-level inference stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, this is very expensive to run, so we might need what we call differentiable codes. Um, yeah, so this is just a summary um, of what I talked about today. Thanks. So, let's... <laughs> so we have lots of discussion, maybe like few questions, uh, one or two, three quick questions. So what, I mean, what's your next step in terms of which data you 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 want to incorporate? Like your bearing. Uh, after HDSS? Yeah. So so we want to use, well, immediate future is GAX. This is to sort of constrain the dust parameters in the UV. Uh, so that's next, but of course we need to go into HST and JWST data as well. And that's sort of um, the attenuation side of things. Um, but something we probably want to include is uh, ALMA data to constrain star formation at higher redshifts. So ALMA, so, so, so these things I will include. Um, and maybe spectroscopic measurements for metallicity constraints. Uh, this is something I'm thinking about as well. And also along the same lines, uh, you want to constrain clustering. Uh, so some bigger surveys, spectroscopy, collect branches to get the clustering right. Yeah. It's a big space of possible things. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. the measurements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but next month or two, Galax data. Okay, yeah. Um, but I mean, something that would be nice is to. Um, so, what I'm thinking with this morphology stuff is to connect morphologies and their time evolution as well. So with JWST images, we could get a high resolution image of all the 
like you, you don't have to observe a whole galaxy with JWST essentially. If you assume that JWST observes the full possible distribution of morphologies, which is not true, we can generate a whole volume of JWST like galaxies. That, that's an uh, exciting possibility of higher GPR. Should we play one more? I'm curious, just a quick one. So you fit your parameter, you find the distribution F. So these functions that you find, do they agree with simulations or they are completely different or like do you learn anything new? Because there is the analysis, right, between all these things. So. Um, or you don't care about the fault? No, so, so we yeah. want to do it. So, we, so what I'm thinking of is to, let's say, take uh, any hydrodynamical simulation and get the dark matter only version and run this and sort of do a one-to-one -one match of whether we can uh, get the same physical properties as hydrodynamical simulation. That's a test we haven't done, but I want to do. No. Um, but obviously, because this is by design matching all the observations, whatever discrepancy is found in hydrodynamical simulations would also be discrepant with, um, with this model. But you don't know that this function would prefer more like the subgrade model of uh, TNG or the subgrade model of Simba or the subgrade model of, uh, of so, Astrid or so, so, so hopefully this functional form can capture at least for star formation rates uh, the possible space that's with TNG, Astrid and all, all sorts of okay, okay. So, so that we, we are exploring all these parameter ranges, right? So flexible enough. All right, okay, so let's thank for the speaker again. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you to understand these things. Okay, let me. Do you have time until? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks, so we are back with you.